Good morning. I'm glad that you're able to take some time to devote to worship, and uh, we're going to jump right in. I have no announcements. We're worshiping inside 10 a.m. Uh, with masks until uh, we get to go back outside for in the next month, and then we'll be outside until uh, the vaccination rate is up, and we're, we're, we're able to come back inside without masks. I can't wait for that. So I guess I did have that uh, continuing announcement for how we'll continue to uh, worship together in these times. So uh, the reading this day comes from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. Thomas, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came after the resurrection. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I remember the first time I saw a completely believable dinosaur on the big screen. I was watching Jurassic Park, in the movie theater, and on this the huge screen in front of me, the music swelled, and, and the two uh, people, the two scientists who were there to see the dinosaurs, they're riding in their Jeep, and they turn, and they look to, to their left, and, uh, or it looks, looks like right to you, doesn't it? But they turn, and they see coming out of the trees, they see these dinosaurs walk, and as they take each step, the whole, like the, the, the subwoofers in the theater it rattled everything, and it was just this moment of, of seeing, and it was amazing. I uh, have been uh, raised as uh, CGI, computer graphics, have, have sort of developed step by step, and so I have been able to watch things and see things that are amazing. To see uh, Yoda go from being a puppet that just kind of hobbled around in Return of the Jedi to being uh, a younger Yoda that bounced around with a lightsaber in the prequel Star Wars. To be able to see Gollum sort of crawling across the floor in that creepy, broken way that he moved in The Lord of the Rings. To see the pirates in the Pirates of the Caribbean. To see the Hulk, uh, the way that the Hulk was uh, shown in the latest Avengers, Avengers Endgame. Like, to see all these things has been amazing. There really isn't much that they cannot put on a screen today. And seeing all these things, thinking through all the things I have seen in the movies and now in TV, it's, uh, CGI and TV is far more common. It reminds me of a phrase that many of us have heard. I dare say all of us have heard. We, you hear the phrase, seeing is believing. But I have to ask, is it? Is seeing, believing? Is that enough? Now, obviously, seeing matters. Seeing is how we engage with much of the world around us, how we see to drive, we see to read, we see to interact with people. Like, seeing matters greatly. But when it comes to what matters, when it comes to what we're connected to, I don't think that seeing is really what leads to believing. I think there's something else that connects us to what really matters. I think it is a matter of touch, right? Think about the importance of touch. When a child is born, does a mom look down at that child and say, okay, good, I've seen the child, I'm good now? Or does the mother want to hold and touch the child? Right? That, that's what happens when, when anyone shows up to uh, worship or shows up to a, any sort of gathering and they have a newborn child. Does everyone just like look at the child and observe? Oh, yes, that's a newborn child. That's good. No, people want to like pass the baby around and the people who get to hold and to touch the child. That is, you, you are connected to that child. Now, that, that's what 
people want, they want touch. And, and that's this sense of the importance of touch. It's used against us in some odd ways. Like if you go shopping, why are all of the clothes racks close to each other? Is it because they want to get that many products on the floor? No. Well, yes, but it's also because if you touch something, you're far more likely to buy it. I, I experienced this. I walked into a store. I had no intention of buying anything. It was a leather store at Springfield, Missouri, and they had whole hides, whole hides of cows, like cow hides laid out, and, and all the tools you could use to, to work with leather and all the examples of what you could use. And I made the mistake if I picked up a piece of leather that had been worked and tooled and made into this, this leather piece, and I picked it up, and as soon as I picked it up, I touched it. I was doomed, because <laughs> I could feel I was it, gorgeous, and yes, I, I walked out of there with it. I had touched it. Right? When, when we've had a rough time, some sort of shock, some sort of problem, right? Something has come up, and, and, and we see each other, and we just, what, what do we do? Do we stand there and look at each other and nod? Okay, I'm here. Or do you go in to give someone a hug? Or at least shake their hand, something. Someone put a hand on their shoulder, some sort of, of touch, some sort of connection, right? It is touch that, that connects us to things. I don't think it's seeing is believing. I think touching, that roots us in things that we believe, things that are real. A touch conveys something far, far greater. And I think we see that in the gospel according to John. All of the gospels have things that they emphasize, and the gospel of John really emphasizes touch. At the very beginning of the Gospel of John, it talks about how the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything that was created was created through the Word, and it's sort of establishing the divinity and the omnipotence and the omnipresence of the Word, and then it says, and the Word became flesh and walked amongst us. And that's the point you go, ah, yes, that, that's... That's something. Right? You talk about some grand cosmic vast thing. That's great. That's a good job. But, but the word became flesh. That's good news, right? Because now something that you can touch, something that is real, like you can touch it. It must be real. When Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, it's the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus talks about how, this, how the Spirit moves and how you might not see it, but you feel it touch. And you feel the touch of it as it moves across your your skin just like the wind moves, right? Nah, that's how you know that it is real. It has touched you. You didn't touch it. It touched you. Then Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is uh, one of my favorite moments in the Gospels, not just because it's, a, okay, yes, it's about food. But uh, Jesus feeds 5,000 people that are gathered. And, and I just love this moment when, when Jesus has all these people who are gathered and they're listening. And, oh, yes, that's a good, that makes sense, Jesus. That's wonderful. But it's when Jesus feeds them here, right? Let me give you something you can touch, something you can hold, something you can eat. When Jesus wants the disciples to understand service, in the end, he doesn't talk about service. He touches their feet. He touches their nasty, grimy, been walking through the cities. They only have sandals on. No one's invented a sock yet, as far as I know. Grimy, dirty feet. Touches them at length. Right? And they don't like it. You read the Gospel of John, you read about the, the washing of the feet at that Last Supper, and they are not happy about it. But touch, right? So the, it conveys a sense of humility there. Why does touch come up so repeatedly in the Gospel of John? I think it bears, uh, it is worth bearing in mind that each of the Gospels was written to a certain community, the communities in which Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John lived. And they're written at different times. And as we look at them, we can see what they focus on. And so Mark, for example, is the earliest of the Gospels. It is the one that is written first uh, in about 60s, maybe 63, hard to pin down exactly. But it's definitively the first Gospel is written down. And there's this sense of, of like, just get it on the page, Mark. Just, just get it written down. We as a community of people following Jesus, we need to make sure we don't forget this. Write it down. So we got it down. And so Mark, it's the shortest of the Gospels. And it, it's just like, just the facts, ma'am. Like, and then the other Gospels that are written later, Luke, Matthew, and then John, which is the last of the Gospels that is written, they show progressively more and more sort of like thought 
in discussion, in reflection upon what is happening. And that's a very good thing. In the Gospel according to John, the story of Jesus as told by the story of John, it is written with a far higher level of just like thinking through who is it that, 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 we, that we touched, right? Who is it that was there with us? Who is this, this Jesus? And there seems to be a sense in the Gospel according to John, an awareness that uh, Jesus might not come back right away. It might be a while. And so what do we need to make sure people understand so that they can hold on to this faith? They can touch it and hold on to it and grab it. Right? I don't know if it's an explicitly chosen motif as, the God, the, as John wrote this gospel or if this God inspired or what, why it worked out this way. But what I can appreciate is the way that as you read the gospel of John, it gives you these places to grab and to touch is because the way that it talks about the experience of following Jesus. And it all comes to an apex here. It all comes to a climax here with Thomas wanting to touch, right? That's the way Thomas grapples with his doubts. To have doubts is not a problem. Right? To have doubts and not deal with them is the problem. Right? But Thomas has these doubts and he's got to grapple with them and he needs to touch something to hold on. He doesn't say, let me see the scars and that'll be good. He says, let me touch the scars. T touching for Thomas is believing. Right? And after Thomas touches this, the, the, the side of Jesus, Thomas confesses a faith in Christ that is the most clear the most definitive statement about who Jesus is in all of Scripture. Right? Jesus touches, Thomas touches and believes, and he says, My Lord and my God. My Lord, right? Adonai, the Greek word, like the one who's in charge of everything. The Adonai, this is the term, the title that is given to God again and again and again. Right? And so uh, only God is addressed by the word Lord in, in, in Scripture in this sense. Like, yes, a king could be called a Lord, but like, my Lord and my God. That's Jesus, my Lord and my God, the one who tells me what to do because he is God. And I have touched and I have believed. What is it that Thomas wants to touch? I think it's worth observing, just taking a moment to, to think about that too. Right? Thomas doesn't say, let, let, let me twist his cheeks and I'll believe it's Jesus. Or let me run in my hand through his hair and yes, then I'll believe it's Jesus. Thomas has a very specific request. Let me touch the wounds. Let me touch the scars. Let me touch the scars in his side. Thomas doesn't want some sort of like phantom Jesus, this, a, a Jesus that just like might look good. Thomas wants to touch the Jesus that hung on the cross and while bleeding from the nails in his sides, he wants to touch the Jesus who then declares from the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Like Thomas needs to touch the real deal. Thomas needs to touch the Jesus that forgave him. The Thomas, he needs to touch the Jesus that he has eaten with, that he has fed the 5,000 with, that he needs to touch the Jesus that washed his feet. All the times that Jesus has touched him, now Thomas needs to touch Jesus so he might know this is Jesus. This is real resurrection. This happened. Right? His belief, his faith has to be rooted in something he can touch. And that got me to thinking. When it comes to believing today, in a time much like the Gospel of John is grappling with, a time when it's, we're not thinking Jesus is showing up any minute now. Maybe, maybe not. I'll get back to you, right? In this time, when a world around us doesn't always look like we hope it would, in a world around us when seeing is not believing, if you see something on the screen, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. In a world that has a hard time with faith, what do we need to touch for us to believe? What do we need to be, touch to be able to echo with Thomas and to proclaim, my Lord and my God? We confess as part of our faith, our belief is that the church is the body of Christ. The church is where God is active as we turn our lives towards him and we follow and we 
are moved by the Spirit and we are guided by what Jesus has said as we gather around the table. Right? This is the body of Christ here gathered together in our bodies, right, in worship. We are connected together in the name of Jesus. And if I want you to believe that God's power is real, that God has moved in my life, I need you to be with me together in a space in which we can touch each other. Right? And if you want to show me the same, if I want to show you and you want to show me, and we want to show to the world, not just what they can see, we need to be able to invite them to touch. And not just touch the parts of our lives that are the gussied up, glossy, isn't life great Facebook posts, where all the children are smiling on our Easter pictures, right? And um, yeah, where everything is just going great. That's not what people need to touch. What people need to touch is the same thing that Thomas needed to touch. He needed to touch the scars. The scars are the places where we have been hurt and where God has healed. The places where loved ones have been lost and we have found joy in the journey again. When trust has been betrayed and we have learned to love again. When lives have been broken by the evil in this world, and there very, really is evil in this world, right? and those lives have been rebuilt, all of these things happen and they leave scars. And we tend to, we don't, we don't want to trot out our scars. We, don't, we want to cover those up, whether those scars are physical or emotional. Yet for Thomas to believe that this was the real deal, this really is Jesus, he needed to touch a scar. And if someone else is going to believe me when I say that the power of God has transformed my life, if I show them where everything is going great in Andy land, well, good for you, whatever. But if I let you touch the scars from when my life has been deeply broken and been healed, that is a different matter. Now, this is a deeply uncomfortable proposal, I admit. It is literally uncomfortable. As we think about the nature of scars, like, just think about the nature of physical scars for a minute. Scars feel weird. Duh, right? They just feel different because things aren't quite what they used to be. I tried to look up the list of the most common scars, and I could not find them, what, that list. But what I did find was the list of the most common surgery, and, and thus the most common, probably the most common scars, right? So the most common surgeries in America, like heart, heart surgery is in there, knee surgery wasn't. But the one, the, the one that I, it makes complete sense now when I saw it on the list, I would not have guessed it, but here it is. Here's the most common surgery in America, the C-section. And that is one humdinger of a scar. Right? Most of my scars are like on my fingers. Like I have a scar right here where I was using a slicing mandolin and I got my thumb and, uh, and it hurts if you touch it. And most of the time, if you touch it, it, I don't feel anything. But if you touch it just right, it's going to go, ee, right? It's going to, it, it'll get me, right? And, and so I have a scar right there. And I actually have a scar right there too. I have a couple scars on my hands. But uh, if you touch my, my thumb just right, it's going to feel really weird. I don't like it. And I have a hard time imagining what it would be like to have a C-section scar on skin that is already far more tender than that of a thumb. And, and to know to have this big long line of, of, of a place where things just don't feel like they used to. Right? I don't like it. Right? No matter where a scar is, to t allow someone to invite someone to touch it, that takes a lot of trust. There's a lot of vulnerability there. It's not like I'm going to walk up to anyone and say, here, touch, touch my thumb right there. So a little bit higher, right, yet yeah, there, and just push, and, and I'm, so I can go, I, I don't like that. To let people touch the scars of my life, not just on my finger, but the places that are truly serious, right? The places of, of emotional pain, the places where my life has been really messed up and put back together. Right? I don't like it, yet I know that if I am not willing to allow people to touch those scars, that people won't believe me when I say that God's power has been made manifest in my life, that God has healed me. Right? In the West, we talk a lot of like parts, parts of the world, West world, Eastern part of the world. In the Western part of the world, Europe, America, we tend to talk a lot about Jesus as the one who forgives, 
In the Eastern part of the world, that, that sort of flavor of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, they talk a lot more about Jesus as the one who heals. And if I want you to believe that Jesus has healed me, I gotta let you po poke a scar and say that is where it happened. That is where healing occurs. For what I see when it comes to our wounds and our scars is first, if we have wounds, those are the places we need to invite people to be praying with and for us so that they might be healed. But when our wounds become, are healed and they become scars, our scars become some of the greatest sources of, of powerful and real ministry. I must confess, like this is me being vulnerable. I, the hardest, some of the hardest times in my life have come from having a deep sense of isolation and disconnectedness. And there were many years where that was very raw and very real, a sense of disconnect. And, and to say to people, and to tell people that is not something I do quickly or lightly, or even to this day, comfortably. And yet it is here at the church where I found people, some like me and some very not, very, very dissimilar from me, who, where I found that connection. And, and so to this day, following Jesus, I have found the community that I need, and that scar has driven me to be the one who seeks out and tries to find others who need that community as well. And so I'd ask, what scars do you have? That might be a starting place for your ministry to others, so that you can show others that the news about Jesus is really good news. It's not something you can just see, but it's something you can touch. And let me show you how that works, right? How can you invite people to touch the scars you have and in doing so show them the good news that you can find joy after the death of a spouse? You don't learn to love living without them, but you learn to love what the other parts of life. What are the other joys, what are the other passions, what are the other desires you can follow knowing that there, there is life after the death of a loved one? All right, that's a real scar. And to share that with people is powerful. Well, how can you share with others the scars that come from having a broken family and building a healthy one in, in the, down the road? There are people who suffer, have deep wounds from being in broken families, who need the hope and the guidance and the help of those who have built, and who have built healthy families after recovering themselves, after being healed. How can you share with people the scars after being betrayed and helping, and after learning how to trust again? There's a deep and real need out there, the people who need to be able to sh be shown that uh, you can trust again. And how does that look like? What's that healing look like? All of this made possible by the power and grace of God, right? and in no other way. Wounds are places where we have, can experience healing and the scars that are left behind can become the source of our greatest past passions and ministries. What a difference would it make for others if when it was appropriate and helpful, an important caveat, right? But what a difference would it make for others if when it was appropriate and helpful, if we would be willing to allow others to touch what has been healed in our lives so that they might have hope theirs. In this day and age when we need help to believe, when it is easy to doubt because there is so much that we see that cannot be trusted, our need might be as simple as Thomas's request. Let me touch. Right? And in touching, to know that God is with us, to know that that which is wounded can be healed, that which is broken can be put straight. I invite you to go forth this week to touch and be touched so that we might more fully believe and be able to proclaim with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may your scars, which inspired such great faith in Thomas, still do so for us. As we touch the meal offered at our, this table that we gather around in worship, and as we feel the touch of your spirit, as we touch the wounds that you have healed in our lives, fill us with faith and give us courage to let others touch these scars in our lives so that others might know that you are still healing even today. 
We pray for those who seek healing. We pray for those who are recovering from COVID. We pray for those wounded by the loss of loved ones. We pray for all these things in the name of your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you this day. Go forth now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.